Good evening. Good evening. Good to see everyone. Hope that you have a good afternoon so far, and, and uh, we're grateful that you're here this evening, ready to worship God together. What a wonderful blessing we have to be able to assemble again and, and uh, sing praises to God and read from His Word and uh, challenge ourselves to grow in our walk of faith. Let me encourage you to remember all the upcoming events that we have. Also, please bear in mind all of the prayer requests that we have listed in the bulletin, also in the prayer chain. So please uh, make a note of those and, and lift them up before God. Tonight, Kevin is going to be leading us in song. John Paul will have our opening prayer. And uh, Johnny is going to be having our scripture reading. Uh, and I believe my dad's going to lead us in a closing prayer tonight. Um, but wonderful opportunity that we have to worship God together. Let's focus our minds on him, lift up our voices in song. Let's all be standing together as Kevin leads us. You are beautiful beyond description to marvelous for words to wonderful together. Our Father in heaven, we come to you this evening thanking you for all the many blessings that you give us. They're too numerous sometimes for us to, to count, but tonight on this 4th of July holiday weekend, we want to focus especially on thanking you for our freedoms, for our independence, for our ability to come together like this and worship you and spend time together in your word. We ask you and pray that you could influence our leaders, our government, to better use your precepts and your guidance. As we learned this morning and remembered how our country started and focused on you 
and how to work, work with each other and live together and take care of each other, be kind to each other. We also pray for all those around the world who don't enjoy all the same freedoms that we do. We uh, pray and that you would be with those, those countries and if it be possible, help them uh, have some measure of those same freedoms. Certainly in, in the meantime and, and going forward, continue to bless the work that we do, our body does here to further your kingdom around the world. Be with those missionaries and those works. Help us to teach more people about you. We also ask you and pray that you help with the wars and all the, and the suffering that many of those in those countries are enduring and the end of those and help those people be more free. Please be with us during this worship service tonight as we, as we worship you and we study you and raise up prayers to you. And we ask that you uh, be with us during that time. We ask that you please continue to forgive us when we sin. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I found in the desert place, though I walked through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing.
scripture reading that Keith has selected for the message this evening is from Deuteronomy 4, 25 through 29. When you become the father of children and children's children and have remained long in the land and act corruptly and make an idol in the form of anything and do that which is evil in the sight of the Lord, your God, so as to provoke him to anger. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will surely perish quickly from the land where you are going over the Jordan to possess it. You shall not live long on it, but will be utterly destroyed. The Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord drives you. There you will serve gods, the work of man's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you search for him with all of your heart and all of your soul. We are closing this series on the faith tonight and just making the simple statement that's very um, apparent to us as we read through Scripture, and that is that God wants to be first in our lives. God does not want to be second place, and it's obvious in Scripture that He wants to be number one. Uh, one of the interesting scenes that we see in the history of God's people takes place in Exodus chapters 19 and 20 and following from there. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Exodus 19 with me for just a moment. I want to look at uh, kind of the setup for where we're going to be tonight. In Exodus 19, the people have made their way to the edge of Mount Sinai and God is uh, conversing with Moses, and he shares with Moses some of the things that Moses needs to know, and gives some instructions that he has for the people. It's verse 16 that says, On the third morning, uh, the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. And then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Verse 18, now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke uh, of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses spoke. And God answered him in thunder. In verse 20, Then the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. If you drop down to verse 23, uh, Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come, up to the mount, uh, cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you yourself warned us, saying, Set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. In verse 24, and the Lord said to him, Go down and come up, bringing Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. And so Moses went down to the people and told them. Now, again, I want, now, again, I want to start out by just simply saying the obvious. From Scripture, we realize that God wants to be first. He doesn't want us to have any other gods. And right after this moment, uh, where Moses and Aaron go back up, we see in chapter 20 what has become known as the Ten Commandments. The first of the Ten Commandments is Exodus 20 and verse 2, where he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. God identifying himself. 
And the words that we see in verse 2 are directly followed by this first of the Ten Commandments. It's verse 3, Exodus 20. You shall have no other gods before me. And so God, very quickly in this scene, is letting them know who he is and letting them know what he expects. And he expects to be first in their life. He doesn't expect to be second place. He doesn't expect to be put on the back burner in any way, but rather God wants to be first. Again, that's very obvious to us throughout Scripture. I have to turn a page, but when you look over at the, toward the end, uh, middle to the end of chapter 20, it's interesting how the scene unfolds. Again, remember in chapter 19 that we just read, verses 16 down through 18, it explains how God descended on Mount Sinai, and there's great smoke, uh, and the mountain is trembling, and all the people tremble. Well, look at verse 18. This is after the Ten Commandments have been given. Verse 18, Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the, the people were afraid, and they trembled, and they stood far off. And they said to Moses, You speak to us, and we'll listen. But do not let God speak to us, lest we die. And Moses, verse 20, said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. And then I love the statement of verse 21. The people stood far off, while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. It's an interesting scene, one that I would love to have seen. Uh, as you think about this, at least in my mind, I can envision as I'm standing quite a ways off and seeing the crowd of people at the base of Mount Sinai and the darkness that's created from the smoke of God descending upon this mountain and the great earthquake or the mountain quaking, as it were, and the people are trembling because they are terrified at what they've seen and heard. Now, I'll tell you, growing up, I, I always, in my mind, envisioned that it was just Moses and Aaron that were able to hear the Ten Commandments, but I'm not convinced that's the case. As a matter of fact, I'm more convinced it's very much the opposite of that, that the people that were gathered around the base of Mount Sinai were hearing God proclaim these commandments. Now, they heard it in the form of thunder, at least that's what Scripture gives to us, and the flashes of lightning and all of this brought terror to them. And they were afraid. They were afraid they were going to die. And so they begin to back away and push Moses forward. You go, you go talk to him. Don't let him talk to us anymore. We can't bear to listen because we're afraid we're going to die. And so Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. That statement there in verse 21 of Exodus 20 is a rather intriguing statement because of the fact that elsewhere in scripture we see that God is light right and every vision that I have of God is this bright light and and he is so brilliant so pure that he shines so brightly as a matter of fact when Moses comes down off of the mountain you remember what happens they have to put a veil over his face because his face is glowing so much from the glory of God reflecting off of him and so the statement of the thick darkness where God was I know for many people, uh, there's great terror when they think about who God is and what God has done. And in reality, throughout Scripture, we see people who come into contact with God and their, their only option seems to be to fall to their face, to the ground, because of who God is. I think God, in this moment, is setting up the stage for His people and for us even today. As we're able to read this particular moment in the history of God's people, God says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, brought you out of the house of slavery. I'm the, the one that you ought to worship. And so that first, that first commandment in verse 3 of chapter 20, you shall have no other gods before me. It's as if God were saying, you need to recognize who I am. Don't mistake my identity you need to recognize that I am the Lord, and you shall have no other gods before me. See, in Jesus' day, there was a debate over the greatest commandment. 
And which one is the greatest was the question that was posed to Jesus in Mark chapter 12. Well, it's verse 30 where we see, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. And certainly we've come to, to know that. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. But there was this debate over which was the greatest, and Jesus made it evident. And I think the point is made very clearly, even when we see in the story of Elijah and the widow of Zarephath in 1 Kings 17. If you turn over there, you remember how Elijah is uh, traveling, and as he comes uh, and is given a word from the Lord to go to Zarephath, um, he comes across the widow there. Look at verse 10. I'm in 1 Kings chapter 17. Verse 10 says, So he arose and he went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was, ga was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, uh, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a, in a jug. And now I'm gathering uh, a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Verse 13, Elijah said to her, Do not fear, go and do as I have said. But first, make me a little cake of it and bring it to me and afterward Make something for yourself and your son. And you remember the story, how all she had left, uh, this, was, this was all they had left, and they were going to just eat, eat what they could and then realize that they're about to starve to death. And Elijah's saying, listen, go and do this. Well, the story continues. It's verse, four, uh, verse 14 where it says, For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth in verse 15 she went and did as Elijah said and she and he and her household ate for many days and the jar of flour was not spent neither did the jug of oil become empty according to the word of the Lord that he spoke to Elijah understanding that God the God that we serve is a God who cares for us and, and a God who calls us to recognize who he is, to follow that first and great commandment, to love him with all of our being. That's what God calls us to, to recognize that he's the one that's going to supply all of our needs. And when we trust in him, we can know for certain that we will not be in want. What a wonderful blessing as we seek first the kingdom of God, knowing that God is going to take care of everything else that we are so worried about in this life. Certainly, uh, life is not without its challenges, and I understand that. I'm not trying to suggest that tonight. But what I am suggesting is from a spiritual perspective, God is calling us to place Him at the pinnacle. And when we do that, putting our full trust in Him, we can know for certain that our future is in His hands. And that's a very great place to be. It's Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, the passage that we just sang about. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. All of the things that we worry about from day to day, those challenges that we face from day to day, God's going to take care of. And we can trust in him. We, we're called to seek him first. Now that, that passage in uh, Matthew 6 verse 33 has two different questions that come out of it at least for me one is who are you first and the second one is uh, understanding that uh, this promise of not losing the things that we give to God and so I want to think about this one first who are you first well I would just say that I am many things I'm a man I'm a Christian I'm a husband I'm a father I'm a son I'm a brother I'm a friend I'm a minister I'm a golfer. How would you describe yourself? Just think about all those words that we use to describe ourselves. I think the ordering of our lives is often a great challenge for us, simply because many times we're selfish. And if we're honest with ourselves, we'll say that we seek our own good above the, uh, the good of others. And that's not what we're called to. As a matter of fact, we're called to yield ourselves to God, to seek Him first, His will for our life. I think all too often our loyalties 
uh, are blinding us to the reality that God wants to do in our life. God simply asks me to be a Christian first. Our thinking sometimes is clouded to reality. But again, I would say God asks us to be a Christian first. And I think this is the key to understanding why God asks us to follow him and yield to him first. He's represented in Scripture as a jealous God. As a matter of fact, he represents himself as a jealous God. It's Exodus 20, again, it's verse 5, where he says, You shall not bow down to them or serve them, talking about any carved image. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And then Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24, says, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Some see God's wanting to be first as very selfish. And they would say, why would we want to serve a selfish God? A God who jealously calls us to follow him just simply to satisfy his own desire. And I would remind us that when it comes to God, God is pure. God is just. And God is all-loving and all-knowing. And he calls us to follow him and yield to him first. But when it comes to us, well, when we put ourselves first, we think, well, surely, uh, you know, surely it's okay for me, and, and surely God wants me to be happy. And I think the reality is God does want us to have joy, but all too often we confuse the joy that God wants us to have with happiness here and now. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29 there the Bible says, you will seek me, or you seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. Maybe that's where we need to focus on. If we are going to yield to God and to seek him first, then that's going to take all of ourselves, our whole heart, our whole soul, our mind, everything about us committed to searching for him, seeking him out calling upon his name. And I think the question for us is, are we seeking God with all our heart, with all our being? In Malachi 3, verse 10, there the Bible says, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. God is saying, put me to the test and see if I will not meet the needs that you have. Seek first the kingdom of God. That's what the text says. As Jesus is teaching there in the Sermon on the Mount, seek first the kingdom of God. Put him first. Have no other gods before him. Understand that he's the one that brought us out of slavery into a place of freedom. And yield to him. And God just simply says there in Malachi 3.10, put me to the test. Put me to the test. Yield your life and your blessings to me and see if I will not open up the floodgates or the windows of heaven and pour down the blessings until there's no more need. Our God is a God who understands very clearly what we need. He understands our heart and he understands our motives and he calls us to put him first in all things. And he says, put me to the test. So my call for us tonight is let's seek first God's kingdom in our lives. Let's put him to the test. He calls for it. And he says, very simply, come see for yourself. I want to challenge us all to recognize who God is. And I know that statement is made quite often. But really pause, and, and I would encourage you to go back and read through that section in Exodus where the people uh, are there around the base of Mount Sinai and they see God for who he is. And to them it's terrifying, but Moses is reminding them, listen, you don't need to be afraid in that way of God. But God is putting you the t to the test. God is saying, I want you to understand who I am so that you will not sin. 
for us, we're called to follow him with our whole heart. And I want to challenge us all to recognize who he is, to yield our will to him, and seek first his kingdom. Putting him to the test, as he says, and watching as he continues to bless over and over. If you're here this evening and maybe you have a need to respond to the Lord's invitation, if we can help you or pray for you in any way, please come while we stand together and sing. Just a couple announcements, very, very short. Uh, Lori and Trish didn't quite make it back to Dallas without coming down with COVID. So uh, Trish was sick and Lori, Lori got sick on the way. So uh, also Joanne Arthur fell this morning and uh, she was supposed to be transferred from Flower Mound Presby to Dallas Presbyterian and uh, she hit her head this morning, so we want to keep those in our prayers. There may be some here this evening that were not able to partake the Lord's Supper during the singing of our closing hymn. If you go ahead and exit out to the foyer, they will show you where to go. We're going to sing Take the Name of Jesus with you, and then we'll have our closing prayer. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for 
another day of life that you've given us. We thank you, Father, for the love that you have for us. And we're thankful for this building that we've had to assemble here tonight and the comfort of it. We thank you for each one here. We ask your richest blessings upon each one of us. And Father, we're thankful for Keith and his ability to preach your word, and we're thankful for the lesson he brought us tonight. We pray that each one of us will uh, plant this message on our hearts and that we will strive to uh, see the opportunities that we have to help others, to bring others to you. And Father, we pray that over this holiday that you will watch over everyone traveling, keep them safe. And Father, most of all, we want to thank you for Jesus and for his uh, willingness to sacrifice his life for our sins. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.